The other was uh, several things that uh, it was humorous at the time. We were flying gasoline to Patton and uh, we were loaded with gasoline and then we were ordered to offload the gasoline and go to an airfield near Reims, France for a special mission. Of course, being young, young guys, we were looking for anything exciting to do. So we thought we may be going to Yugoslavia that night to drop some stuff for the partisans, which were done occasionally. So we landed up at um, Reims, France, and finally a couple of trucks came in and said, you fellas on mission one, two, three, four, or whatever? I said, yep. Well, then we have a load for you. So when they started loading up, I said, what do we got? He said, you got a whole load of toilet tissue to fly to the First Army up north. It seems, though, that they have the GIs. Well, we did, and we had a little laugh out of that, but when we got back to the base that night, I will not repeat the names that we were called. Who were some of the VIPs that you uh, catered to? The, first, the fir very first one was uh, Postmaster General Hannigan, who was in Tru Truman's administration. And, uh, well, just about got court-martialed on that deal. It was not my fault, but finally the engineering officer ended up getting court-martialed. We had a colonel by the name of Colonel Steinmetz. And um, he came down to the operations shack, and I happened to be the only one there. That's how I got on that category. <clears throat> he said that aircraft shall be there a certain time, certain day. So. I immediately, there uh, was another colonel with him, Colonel Copsey. And Colonel Copsey stayed behind, and while, I, while Colonel Copsey was there, I called the engineering department and told them, you know, that everything had to be right. So I selected the crew, which I knew was very good, for the trip, because it was going to be for 30 days. It ended up being a 35-day trip that he had. He just went everywhere. And... <laughs> But anyhow, the crew, I told them, I said, now look, it's got to be up at, the eight, at 800 sharp. You'd be up there at quarter to eight. Okay, so they go down at seven o'clock to pick the airplane up, and by God, they couldn't get it started. And they fiddled around, and here somebody had taken the batteries out of it, out of the VIP aircraft. The VIP aircraft was really C-47, but place seats and sofas in it. it was really rigged up really nice so they finally they finally got up there at 10 minutes after eight well here here he come man he just chewed me out till the fly wouldn't light on me and he on a court martial me and he didn't know why captain Ede would give a young fellow like that the responsibility to, to take care of something for first match of general Hannigan. So anyhow, Colonel Copsey came forward and said no. He did everything he was supposed to do, and so the poor engineering officer got court-martialed. But and Paula Gardard uh, flew her one time, and the funny part of it was she was supposed to come to Dover here, and she on a bond tour, she didn't come. So was there a reason why she didn't come? Well, uh, I'll, t I'll tell you this. Our CEO at that time, um, I'll not mention his name, he was not Colonel Steinmetz or Colonel Copsey, called me one day and said, uh, if I could uh, have the VIP airplane uh, for Saturday morning, he said, I'd like to take a flight. And I said, all right. So he said, I want you to go with me as my co-pilot. So I taxied the airplane up there, and here he comes out with this girl, and this looked like she had a rabbit coat on, white rabbit coat. And look, sure, here was Paula Garter. So he introduced her to her, and I didn't say nothing to her about that. So we flew to Frankfurt, Germany. So after we got a, up in the air, why he, uh, went in back and he said, let me know when we're 20 minutes out of Frankfurt. So I did. They came back up and blew it. 
So coming back to Paris, he said, uh, now next Saturday morning, he says, I want you to get somebody to go with you and go pick Miss Goddard up, somebody that's, that's discreet. I said, okay. So the next Saturday morning, we were up at Frankfurt, Germany at, at 10 o'clock in the morning when we were supposed to be there to pick up Miss Goddard to bring her back to Paris for the weekend. Well, she never showed up. Four o'clock came. So I said, well, we got to go back because we didn't have any radio aids to speak of then to, uh, in case weather closed in or whatever, you know. So we get back while I land and the colonel says, well, where's your, where's Miss Goddard? So we stayed till four o'clock, sir, and she didn't show up. Yeah, all right, and thank you. So in other words, she just didn't have uh, any history of doing what she's supposed to do when she's supposed to is all I know. After the war was over, we Low Point boys were sent to the 27th Air Transport Group. Now, it flew all C-47s. They then they did a lot of the inner European theater stuff, but they didn't do they didn't do what troop carrier did, like jump paratroopers or etc. And so they started a civilian airline called European Air Transport Service. Took all the insignia and everything off of the uh, C-47s. A lot of troop carrier aircraft were assigned to them also. And there was a squadron in every main city in Europe. There was Berlin, London, Paris, Munich, Rome, Naples, and so forth. And each one would fly scheduled flights throughout Europe and Italy. Anybody could fly on them as long as they had the proper credentials and the money. I remember the cost to fly from Paris to Rome was $55. And they got a good box lunch and that was it and sat on those hard bucket seats. But that airline took the place of the civilian airlines at that time. And uh, so that the transportation was available to anybody to go anywhere they wanted it to as long as they had the money and everything else. But it was odd that they took all the insignias off the aircraft, but the crew still had to fly in their uniforms, you know. And um, this went on, and I would say probably up until the time of the Berlin airlift, <clears throat> and also participate in the Berlin air for that time. And after that, why, uh, I don't know what happened, it went to AMC or, or what, but they rearranged everything so it could be in that. But um, we had a lot of VIPs that came into Paris, and that was one of my duties, was uh, to, as a, per of a pilot, flying VIPs. And the last three months of the war, I, I uh, was also a personal pilot to General, Brigadier General Melvin C. Smith. He was in charge of the Office of Foreign Liquidation Commission. And his duties was to dispose of all the surplus equipment in Europe. And at that time, he sold a lot of the C-47 surplus to Holland, to uh, Switzerland, to different countries to start up their airlines. And the one amazing thing about it, that during the war, the C-47 did not have uh, self-sealing gas tanks, which was pretty rough. Here you've got a whole load of 100 octane gas plus in your tank and self sealing gas tanks. I don't know where the wisdom came from, but after the war was over and we moved to Paris, why then they sent all the aircraft to Burtonwood, England to put self sealing gas tanks in them. So they put self sealing gas tanks in all the aircraft, and then they started these scheduled flights, and then we didn't have enough gasoline to go to. Munich and back. So there must have been some wisdom there somewhere that I neglected to pick up on. Well, we all had an opportunity to stay in the service, but then we had to sign up for another 18 months. And um, I, uh, well, I, very frankly, I was very, very homesick. And uh, 
Uh, I asked them, could I go home for 30 days? They said, well, no, you could three months ago, but now they've done away with a 30-day deal, so it's it. So I'd already been overseas nearly two years, and I was anxious to get home, and that's it. After my military service ended, why, well, of course, being a farm boy, I helped my father on the farm. And not knowing exactly uh, what to do, and uh, uh, but uh, and the funny thing about it was, there's two things I never liked to do on a farm: I was milk cows and pick tomatoes. And every time I got to leave home, we were picking tomatoes. So I was picking tomatoes when I got out. So it was the year that the blight hit, the fungus disease hit tomatoes, and all all the farmers had tomatoes. So we had to get an airplane in from New Jersey to dust these tomatoes. So I'm standing there watching him dust tomatoes, and I said, heck, I can do that. And that's when I started my business of crop dusting and spraying. And in 1947, I started one airplane. In 1948, we increased it six, and we covered the whole eastern shore. And uh, got my fellow buddies uh, from the Delaware National Guard who were for pilots up there. They came to work for me too. So uh, it's been given a lot of thought to it, and I I know that and do believe we have to have a strong military. And it's just like Teddy Roosevelt said, we got to carry a big stick, you know. And uh, if we show any signs of weakness or anything like that, why? Well, it's, it's going to affect us, so I think we should continue to have a good, strong armed forces. And I was, of course, like so many of them, right out of high school, into the service. But I, uh, I was a assistant operations officer after the war was over, and under a Captain George Ede, George J. Ede, E A D E, he further became a four-star general. And I learned an awful lot that helped me in business. Uh, dedication to the job and doing everything. In other words, he was a good role model. And uh, I would say that I had a more learning experience under him for future being in business and uh, that I got anywhere else that I could not got it in school.